You know that feeling you get when you've got these really, really good results and you're just really excited to share them with the world and you think everyone's going to be really excited to see what results you have. And then you know that other feeling that you sometimes get with that one when you get this sinking suspicion that maybe those really good results are just too good to be true? So this happened to me a few months ago. Um, I lead the engineering team at Ursa Labs. We're one of the leading developers behind the Apache Arrow project. So Arrow, as you may know, uh, is essentially building the foundation for the next generation of data frames and bigger data analysis. And I maintain Arrow's R package. So I was meeting with our studio's leadership because our studio has been a generous sponsor of Ursa Labs from the beginning. So I'm in the call and I'm there with Hadley Wickham and with uh, JJ Allaire, you know, founder, CEO of our studio, Tarif Kowaf, who's president. And I was telling him about this, this result that I found recently, which was I had been benchmarking Arrow's CSV reader and found that you know, Arrow has lots of great things that it does in its library. I'm gonna show you some of them in this talk. But even if you just use Arrow as a CSV reader and use it to read a data frame into R, and then you could use any other R package on that data frame afterwards, you could get a big benefit. And in fact, even on this uh, particular New York City taxi data set that I was uh, testing out on, I found that Arrow was two to three times faster than Data Table's CSV reader. And at this point, Hadley cuts me off and says, yeah, I don't know, that doesn't sound right. You know, Data Table, uh, that, that group, they have optimized really everything that you could optimize out of reading, reading data into R. And so, you know, Maybe you could match their performance. Maybe you could get a little bit better, but you couldn't be that much better because they've done everything you could do. And Tarif added, yeah, you probably screwed up something in your benchmarking code. You know, you probably actually didn't do all the work you thought you did. And I thought about it and it's like, wow, that's actually a much more logical, simpler explanation for the result that I found that I screwed up something in my code. But I figured I'd, I'd go check it out and, you know, get back to them. And I, you know, compared the objects that I had. Uh, the data frames read by both were the same size, 15 million rows, both really big in memory. Uh, so it, it checked out. It turned out Arrow's CSV reader was two to three times faster than data tables here. So we'd achieved uh, an incredible result. It was literally incredible. Like this group of people here that know a lot about the internals of R literally did not believe that it was this fast. So how are we able to do that? So what I want to talk about today is how characteristics of the Arrow project and particularly the community around it enable us to do things that uh, we might otherwise have thought would be impossible to do in R. So a little history. So Arrow uh, was started in 2016. Uh, a group of database developers and data frame library maintainers got together and realized that they were all trying to solve similar problems. And then rather than saying, you know, this is fine and we're just going to keep duplicating each other's work, what if we worked together and created a shared uh, foundation for our work and we would all benefit from that? So Arrow is fundamentally about three things. First is it is a format, it is a specification for how data is represented in memory. It's columnar and it's designed to take advantage of features of modern CPUs and GPUs and other hardware. There's also a set of 12 libraries that implement it in different languages. Uh, Python and R uh, use the C++ library, uh, but there are many others uh, in the, in the Arrow project. And then third, there's this broader ecosystem of packages around uh, and projects around Arrow that use Arrow in some form, whether it's as their internal data model, data model or as it's just a means of exchange between projects. So how does this, how do these characteristics of Arrow lead us to get such unbelievable performance and be able to ena enable us to do things that we didn't think were possible in R? So in terms of modern hardware, uh, Arrow is designed to take advantage of many features that, of CPUs that exist now that didn't exist when R was developed initially. So R was first released in 1995. Uh, of course, computer technology has progressed quite a bit since then. And there's things that we can do, I can do on my laptop now that you know, was not part of, not something that was a thing back then. 
So for example, my, C my laptop here has got eight cores. Uh, that's CPUs that you can run in parallel. You can get a, a host on, a on AWS with 96 cores. That's pretty good. But R is generally only using one of those. So we're leaving a lot of performance on the table. Uh, newer CPUs also can take advantage of what's called SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. Um, my laptop, for example, can take up to 256 bits at a time. So that would be the size of eight integers in R. Uh, other newer ones can do 512 bits. So you, you can feed a lot more data into the CPU at a time if your code is designed to take advantage of that, but R generally is not. So it's like you have this super fast sports car and you just want to take it for a spin around the track and see what you can do with it. But for whatever reason, you know, you have to keep it, you have to keep it under 25 miles an hour, you know, drive, keep your hands at 10 and 2 on the handle, on the steering wheel. No, nothing too crazy. And it's a really missed opportunity. So what do you do about that? So you could uh, write some C or C++ code in your R package to uh, do multi-threading to take advantage of all those extra cores that you have available. Um, you could write code to do SIMD optimizations, uh, but that's that's really hard, uh, frankly. And you know the number the number of people that know how to do that well isn't that great, probably. And the number of people who do that and are going to be writing R packages is even smaller. So here's where the large Arrow community comes in handy here. So the, uh, the Arrow project has had, you know, since it was created in 2016, it's had a steady growth of uh, contributors to the project over time. Well, well over 500 by now. And what this means is all of these people are working together on this project that's, uh, and the benefits are shared. So in order to have uh, smart multi-threading in the R package, I didn't have to write that. Someone else who understands how to do that much better than I would did that. I didn't have to write SIMD code either. There are other people, people who work on hardware uh, that, uh, you know, the actual CPUs themselves that know what those uh, options are. They wrote that code and they're all contributing in. And they're not contributing in because they wanna make the R package faster. Uh, they're contributing in because uh, they are using the C++ library for some other project, or they're using Python, which uses the same C++ library that the R package does. So we benefit from all these other uh, communities' contributions. So, so what does that look like? So to give an example of how this work plays out in reality, I wanna talk about this example, this demo that I gave last year at our studio conference. Um, I was introducing the Arrow R package and um, and I was going through this example with the data set where uh, you take uh, about 10 and, a, um, 10 and a half years of New York City taxi data, two, million, 2 billion rows, and you could scan that and do, get some results on that on your laptop. So I did some kind of sample dplyr, you know, filtering and selecting and grouping and aggregating on this data set that I opened with the arrow package where I pointed at a directory of these files and then I could query it. And I got a result in four seconds over two billion rows. That was pretty good. We we're really happy with that. Um, I did a talk uh, this past summer and I redid the result just on the latest version of the code and it was twice as fast. And I hadn't really done anything in the R package to do that. This is all based on improvements in the underlying C++ code that all the rest of the community was working on. Uh, right before I did this talk now, I ran the code again on the latest version, and it's another 25% faster. Again, I, haven't, I didn't do anything to make that happen. It's, it's just based on the, the Arrow community and its work. So, uh, you know, how, there's other reasons, other ways that this ecosystem plays out and has benefits for us in the, in the R community. So, you know, when you hear that a bunch of database developers got together and decided that there wasn't a good standard for, uh, for columnar data and they were going to create their own standard to unify all of these, uh, it might bring this XKCD comic to mind, um, where the creating, creation of standards to solve the lack of standards just, you know, makes more problems, more standards, more competing standards. Um, and there certainly is that risk. But you know, five years on from the uh, creation of Arrow, we can start to see, we we can see now how the the benefits of this approach have played out. 
So just to give an example, so suppose I've, I've got data in Spark and I want, to, I want really quick access to that in Python and R. Um, what you could do is that you could, from Spark, you could write uh, you know, an, a special adapter for Python, a special adapter for R, that understands, uh, you know, for in the R, R's case, you understands R's you know, vector types and specific you know, the bits in the, in the vectors that make up a data frame. And you have to do the same thing for, for Python, for NumPy, or, or Pandas. Um, and you know, Spark, in its Java code, would have to understand how to do this. Um, I, I put another error in, the, error in the chart there to connect the interchange between Python and R. That's obviously something you'd want to do too. And it's another place where you'd need uh, someone on the other side of the language barrier to understand the internals of your format. So that's feasible if, if this is all you care about. But you know, in reality, the system is there's many more languages and there's many more projects and too many to fit on the slide. Um, and as you can imagine, if you try to draw all of those lines to you know, connect the various adapters to the different things, it gets crazy really quickly. So, so what do you do? You're obviously not gonna do that. That's too much work. Um, and so you know, what you want is to have a ubiquitous standard that everyone can write to and read from. And then you don't have to, you don't have to re-implement everything every time. Um, so what in, what in you know, prior to Arrow, what you do is you probably just dump out a CSV. Every, every language knows how to read a CSV. Every database knows how to read in a CSV. Um, but this, is, this comes with some costs. CSVs can be expensive to read and write because you have to convert between a string format on disk to the, you know, the arrays of, of bits that, you, that R and, and other languages use in memory to do work. Um, and that conversion is costly. And CSV also doesn't have rich support for types. You know, you may have uh, timestamps and you don't have any way of indicating that this is a timestamp. You have to guess whether it should be just a regular string or a timestamp. And so there's lots of costs and uh, penalties that come from doing this. But CSV is kind of the you know, lowest common denominator. And so that's why it gets picked up. But what Arrow is kind of a happier version of that, where you, are, uh, you have a standard and it's columnar and it's binary, so it matches very closely with how R or Julia or Spark or any of these uh, languages actually work with data and memory. So the conversion is minimal, and in some cases doesn't actually involve copying memory because it, where it does actually line up as being the same shape. So it's very efficient. And from our perspective in the R community, what this means is once we have an now that we have an Arrow R package, we have access to all of these other uh, projects and databases and languages uh, very efficiently, as long as they also can write to Arrow. And over the last five years, we've seen uh, an increasing number of projects that have picked up on Arrow for this because it's really efficient. So going back to Spark for our example there, um, early on in, uh, in Arrow's life, uh, uh, we added support to uh, in PySpark, the Python Spark library, to communicate with Spark the database, which is written in Java, uh, very efficiently using Arrow. And so, you know, you'd get you know a hundredfold speed up on certain operations, whether it's with user-defined functions or whether you're just pulling a large amount of data into your your uh, your Python environment to do further analysis on it. And that worked because Java has an error library, Python has an error library, and they write the same format. The beauty of this is that once we finally got the R package going, we could pick up and do the same thing. These are both uh, references to blog, uh, blog posts on the error website. So we were able to take advantage of the same thing. And uh, because we can read and write arrow from R, um, we didn't need to do any other special Spark business in order to get those, you know, 100x speed ups um, of pulling data to and from uh, Spark and R. So the Arrow format is designed to take advantage of modern hardware and the power of the large community of developers around the Arrow project really changed what we're able to do in R and enable all sorts of new workflows that weren't really possible or, or feasible before. So, you know, it's nice, like I showed in the beginning, to, to see that, um, you know, 
Arrow makes, you know, like reading CSVs into R faster. And, you know, it's, it, we like seeing that. But that's really not the goal. You know, we're not just trying to shave off a little bit of time from, from work, work that you already can do now. Uh, we're trying to go beyond that. We're trying to enable new workflows that were either cost prohibitive to do before or just frankly not, not possible at all. So there's a lot more coming in the next release, in the coming releases this year in 2021. I'm really excited to be able to tell you about them when they come. Uh, but for now, I wanted to just uh, go back and, and walk you through another example of something you can do today in the Arrow package that um, is a little bit beyond what you would normally do in R, uh, but can really uh, have some, some uh, impossible seeming results, let's say. So um, earlier I showed reading a, uh, a data set of 125 files of New York City taxi data that was in the Parquet format. Uh, Parquet is a file format that you can read in the Arrow package. It's a columnar, very efficient file format. Um, often, of course, you don't have Parquet files yet, and one of the reasons you want to use Arrow is to get your less efficient CSV data into Parquet so that you can read it more quickly. Um, so the Arrow package has some facilities for doing this. Uh, so here's an example. I read, uh, I, I converted some of those Parquet files back to CSV. I only did six months of it because CSVs are big and it takes a lot of space. Um, but you can, uh, just as you can point at a directory of Parquet files and say open data set, you can do that with CSVs. And you can do the same kinds of uh, queries on them that uh, you did, you know, I showed with the Parquet data set, you know, selecting and filtering and grouping, aggregating all of these things. Um, and as you see, you know, the result here, the one I showed is a different query, so it's not apples to apples, but, you know, it took uh, seven and a half seconds to do this query over this data. Um, it's pretty good. The fact that I didn't have to mess with uh, reading each of the files and individually and doing things with it, that's good. Um, but, you know, I think we can do better. So one of the things we want to do is we could write the data set to a more efficient format, either Parquet, as I mentioned, or Feather, which is the Arrow format. It's literally the Arrow format on disk. So uh, we can use similar types of dplyr style uh, syntax to do this. I can say group by this payment type column in the data set. Uh, that was one of the columns that I filtered on before. And when I, in this case, when I'm writing a data set, when I say group by, what that means is I want you to partition my data by that. And what that's going to do is it's going to write out separate files inside different directories based on the value of that variable. So payment type in this data set took on values 1 to 5. So now I've got inside my feather taxi directory, I've got five subdirectories, one for each of the values of payment type that now have uh, different Parquet files in it, or Feather files, excuse me. And what this means is when I do a query again on this data set, I only, and if I, and if I filter on payment type, I only have to look at the files inside that directory that correspond to the value of payment type that I'm filtering on. I don't even have to read the other files in to see if they match my filter, because I've kind of pre-filtered it based on this partitioning. So indeed, if we do the same query that I just did on the CSVs, but I do it on the Feather version of the data set, it's now 100 times faster than before. Exact same query, just with a more efficient uh, file format and uh, taking advantage of partitioning uh, in the data set query. So this is great. Uh, you know, we're trying to make things that have been you know, difficult or impossible possible. Uh, trying to help you take a full advantage of the sports car that you've got on your lap when you're, uh, when you're working in R. Um, but, you know, really I like to think of what we have is not just in the old sports car, sports car but it's, it's a DeLorean, uh, perhaps with a flex capacitor in it. And where we're going, we don't need roads. We're going beyond what you could be doing on your laptop today even. So, thank you very much. Thank you.